Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're very excited to welcome you to this very first SHOT webinar. So we'll be um, launching the annual SHOT report today and thank everybody for joining in. The, the format of today's session is we're going to have a 30 to 40 minute presentation from Dr. Narian co um, covering the um, key highlights of the SHOT report. This is then going to be followed by a question and answer session. So unfortunately, you don't have the facility to actually speak questions, but what we would like to encourage you to do is use the question and answer box down at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you could refrain from using the chat facility, we can't monitor that quite as closely, but the question and answer facility, you should either get an instant re um, response or we'll answer you later in the session. Um, if we don't have time to get around to your question, don't worry about that. We'll um, be giving a list of the question and answers following the session alongside um, a recording, which will all be available on our website with some other lovely new resources that we've got there for you as well. So um, following the question and answer session, we'll have a short poll just about the day, and then um, hopefully everything will be tied up after that. We've also got with us today um, our artist, Jenny Leonard, who's been doing a lot of work for the shop team. So hopefully we'll have a nice, interesting um, illustration to see at the end of the session as well. Lovely. So I think that's all the really key questions about how we're going to do things today. Um, the question and answer session is going to be manned by the shop team, as well as some members of our working expert group. So today we have with us Paula Bolton-Mags, who's um, part of the ADU chapter. She's written that and authored, and you all know Paula very well. We've got Joe Flanagan for transfusion transmitted infections. We've got Megan Rowley and Jenny Davis. They'll be covering some IT related questions. We should have Helen New. She should be joining us for some pediatric questions. Um, uh, sorry, our anti-D anti questions and pediatric questions. Um, we've got Courtney here for some other anti-D questions. And we've also got Dr. Tom Latham here to follow some trialy questions and um, Chris Robbie for the MHRA. I think that's everybody. I apologize if I've forgotten everybody at the end of that, but I think that's mainly our panel list for today. Um, so I'm going to now pass over to Professor Mark Bellamy, who's chair of the SHOT steering group with for some opening comments. Hello, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. It's been a very interesting uh, exercise compiling this year's SHOT report and indeed running SHOT through the current pandemic. So first of all, uh, I'd like to say a huge thank you um, to all of our reporters and just to say that reporting remains hugely hugely important during difficult times and more so uh, than during normal circumstances partly because we're facing different challenges um, partly because um, different staff are giving transfusions. A lot of staff are working in critical care areas who are pulled out of other areas of the hospital. Um, and a lot of the real estate around the NHS has been repurposed especially. So a huge thank to our reporters um, who are working under very difficult circumstances, but are continuing to contribute to the very important work of hemovigilance that uh, SHOT carries on. Second big thank you is to our colleagues in the MHRA um, with whom we share a lot of data and uh, share a lot of the work and we update each other regularly uh, on major issues. SHOT would not be possible without the efforts uh, above and beyond which the SHOT team have put in over the last few months. It's always a difficult time running up to producing the report with tight deadlines to meet. Uh, and normally we have the annual Congress to, uh, to stage as well. Well, we almost staged it. A lot of the work to run the annual Congress still happened, uh, but clearly under the circumstances, we were not able to have a physical meeting as we would like to have done. Nevertheless, um, a huge thank you to all of the team. There have been a number of interesting new departures that SHOT has been involved with over the last few months. For example, collecting data for a lot of the big um, national exercises which are going on through COVID, and in particular, the convalescent plasma trials, looking at safety data from convalescent plasma administration 
um, both in the remap cat trial um, and now of course convalescent plasma is also being um, launched as an arm of the recovery trial so this is a a new departure for shot and a a, a very important one so without further ado i'm going to hand over to Shruti Narayan, our medical director, uh, to run you through the highlights and headlines. Shruti. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, I hope everybody is able to see the screen now. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And um, again, I'm following on from Mark. I would like to take this opportunity to say a big thank you to everyone for all your hard and selfless work during these challenging times. We are grateful to all of you, our transfusion community, for rising to the challenge in these unprecedented times. Um, we continue to work closely and collaboratively with our colleagues at MHRA in covering hemovigilance in UK. To just refresh our memory with the key recommendations from our 2018 annual SHOT report, this covered the need for a just learning culture, also highlighted the importance of human factors principles. And we also actually mentioned, again, stressed the importance of making good transfusion decisions after assessing the risks and benefits of transfusions. Thanks to everyone who had responded to our recommendation survey, and it is really encouraging to see how you have all been implementing these recommendations and working towards improving transfusion safety. Shruti, uh, your screen isn't Shruti. visible. Sorry? The screen isn't visible, Shruti, the presentation. Ah. So is that coming through now? Yes, I've got that now. Okay. So, is the main slide visible now for all of you? Yes. Okay. Um, Sorry, everybody, with the teething problem that we are actually having. So these were the main recommendations from the uh, 2019 um, uh, report that we have. And what is the state of affairs that we have in um, the um, blood transfusions in um, 2019? Now, we see that about 2.3 million blood components issued in UK in 2019. And it is important to actually maintain perspective in this. So what do we see? We received around 4,000 reports to SHOT, but equally it is important to note that blood transfusions are generally safe. The risk of death is around one in 135,705 uh, blood components issued, and of serious harm is around 17,884 components that were issued. And the risk of transfusion transmitted infections are much lower than all other transfusion related complications. Now, year in your year for the last four to five years, we have been having um, the four UK blood services um, contributing to the donor hemovigilance vigilance chapter. And um, the same this year, um, coordinated by my esteemed colleagues in the donor, transfer, uh, donor hemovigilance. These are the key highlights that we note. Now, th those 2.3 million uh, transfusions came from 1.8 million donations in 2019. And overall, we see a low rate of serious adverse event of donation that is around 0.23 per 10,000 donations. And two big categories that continue are donor problems related to needle insertion, where you have arm pain lasting for more than 12 months after donation, or vasovagal reactions resulting in donor hospitalization or injury. These are the two big categories and they continue to be the same pattern. And delayed faints, wherein faints which are seen after exiting from a blood donation session, they accounted for around 14%, and they were largely seen in female regular whole blood donors. And there was one donor death reported, but this was not related to blood donation, and the donor died of bilateral pulmonary embolism. Now, it's important to note that 80% of the donors who suffered a serious adverse event of donation were withdrawn from future donations, and therefore it is of utmost importance that we make sure that we prevent these complications, address these complications in a timely manner and improve donor safety and donor experience. Now, we all agree that all the donors must be made aware of any material risks involved in blood donation as part of the consent process. And this is also important to ensure donor retention, which is a fragile donor base that we all have. But it's also important to note that complications during or following blood donation can happen despite the safety measures in place. 
Now, all of you will agree these are the essential critical elements of any great safety culture. So first and foremost, we need to have a good reporting culture that we are ready to share and we learn from each other. It is also a just culture. There is also a need to be flexible, to be adaptable, to also be able to learn and to embed the lessons that we are learning, but equally also have the questioning culture that is instilled in all our organizational cultures so that we question the practices of each other and learn from each other. Now, these uh, figures show that we do have a good reporting culture in UK. If we see, there are more than 4,000 reports that have been submitted to SHORT in the last year, and roughly they coordinate around um, 18 reports per 10,000 components issued. And we do acknowledge that there is actually, we are good at learning from these and also incorporating um, lessons from from these reports, but we also acknowledge that there are areas of underreporting. For example, if we see hyperhemolysis, cell salvage reports, reports related to delayed or undertransfusion, we do know that there are areas um, of underreporting and we need to address these. Now, a key question that we are asking is, while we are reasonably good at reporting and using the data to inform improvements and practices, we do not do enough to acknowledge continuing excellence in transfusion practices. So here it is. For the first time, we have included a chapter on learning from excellent practices. This is about being curious about the realities of daily work and learning from all events and recognizing building adaptability in the healthcare. It is about appreciative inquiry. It is about building resilient teams and systems. And I would encourage all, the re uh, all of our readers to read that particular chapter and also encourage you to start incorporating learning from excellence in your own practices as well. Now with this, we are also promoting the concept of a safety synergy between the safety one as well as the safety two concepts. Safety one, which is actually a reactive and a safety two, which is proactive. Now both of them augment each other. And therefore what we really need is to actually improve patient safety. We need both of these approaches, the safety one as well as the safety two are needed. So what we are doing now is actually reframing the patient safety and this has major implications for the way we design our systems and the role of the people within them. And these affect everything from when, how we are approaching incidents to how we are approaching quality improvement to the way we are training as well as leading teams. So what does this mean for teams? So when I say we need to combine safety one and safety two, now it then means um, you're having debriefing procedures even when things go right. So you're asking the questions, short questions, did everyone know what was going on? Were we all cleared in our roles? What hazards did we pick? What did we miss? What were the surprises or the workarounds? And therefore part of making as much as possible go right means that you're making visible the hidden work that people do to successfully navigate the problems. So even safety too examines the failures, but it asks the different questions to understand the actions that people take. So being curious in this way is helping learning in a way that judgment and blame never can. And therefore you're building in that adaptability, building in that flexibility and resilience within the teams. And this will have a profound effect on the teams because everybody will get a sense of being part of a collective which support each other, values their contribution, and that is trying to constantly improve. And therefore this is a powerful antidote to the daily challenges of uh, frontline care. And therefore all of you will agree that to truly improve patient safety, it is not just important to learn when things go wrong, but also when things go right, which is in majority of the circumstances. And this leads us to one of our main recommendations from this year, that in every healthcare system, the healthcare leader should proactively seek signals for improvement from excellent care, not just when things go wrong. When we look at the summary data for 2019, so this is actually the, of all the reports that we have actually seen, including near misses and the right component uh, to the right patient. Now near misses continue to constitute the majority of these reports, nearly around 38.6% of the reports. And I will explore this a bit more later, but they do represent um, valuable learning opportunities. However, we also do get steady reports of pathological reactions, such as the febrile allergic hypotensive reactions, and hemolytic transfusion reactions, and we will aim to cover the key highlights from these reports over the course of the next half an hour. Errors continue to account for most of the reports, and this has consistently been more than 80% of the reports last few years. But it is important to stress that as seen from the reporting triangle that you actually see here, that largely the reports are near misses or the right blood, right patient. And it's only a small number of deaths, around 0.1% that we actually notice. 
so we can do better to actually improve our transfusion practices and make them safer. And when we look at the transfusion related deaths that were reported in 2019, there were 17 transfusion related deaths and of these, five of them could definitely have been prevented. And when we look at the causes, they're largely either under transfusion or delays, which accounted for two of these cases, or it could be TACO, and there was also one related to the delayed PCC administration. And when we look at the trend of the transfusion-related deaths in the last decade, TACO, which are the ones in orange bars, and delays, which are the red, they are the most prevalent cause of transfusion-related deaths year on year, and every effort needs to be made to address these. Now focusing on some of the error reports that were submitted to SHORT and what can we learn from them. Now inadvertent ABO incompatible transfusions are considered essentially um, preventable and that's why they're termed as never events in um, most of the places. And this is because when you have robust place processes in place, people are compliant with procedures and staff are vigilant, then these are preventable. But we do see these year on year and we had six such ABO incompatible transfusions inadvertent ones in 2019. Four were related to the red cells and the rest were related to FFP. And there was a combination of clinical errors and laboratory errors, but majority had the potential to be identified at the administration step. And this again stresses the importance of the bedside administration checklist and trends are seen year on year with the same message and that's why there was also a chief um, uh, CMO's uh, alert that was issued to ensure that the administration checklist is actually done. So when we delve deeper into all of these ABO incompatible transfusions and the wrong components transfused, what are the common themes that emerge? One of them there is key issues with limbs. So either the limbs is allowing non o red cell issue in an emergency, or there is no rule to prevent the release of group O FFP in an emergency. But equally, we do see there is lack of either staff, adequate staff, adequate training of the staff, adequate knowledge, so that they don't know the rationale for the decisions. And therefore, this allows to assumptions, incomplete checks and distractions, and also overriding of the flags. And all of you will then be familiar and you will agree with me. But when we look at all the contributory factors in all of these, one or more of the dirty dozen keep cropping up. And it is important that we all staff in transfusion remain vigilant, do not assume and verify at each step and build user-friendly design, uh, user-centered processes. And when we look at the next major category in, within the incomplete, uh, sorry, incorrect blood transfusions uh, transfused, that is the specific requirements not met, this constitutes the majority of the IBCT reports, nearly 80% of them. And again here, errors are seen in both the clinical as well as the laboratory areas. And a majority of the errors occurred at the request step, which is around 25%, or at the testing step, which was around 24.3%. Similar themes continued. Again here, it is gaps in knowledge, gaps in understanding, communication errors, and documentation gaps, or lack of adequate checks are contributory. So therefore we say that um, with every transfusion, you need to ask the fundamental question whether the patient has any specific requirements for blood transfusion. When we look at near misses for these wrong component transfused, um, they con the near misses constitute a significant number and in that it is actually wrong blood in tube represents the largest proportion of near misses, nearly 55.4% of the near misses and around 25% of the actual events are due to wrong blood in tube. And in that further, it is patient identification errors are the most common reason for wrong blood in tube. And this is nearly 42.6% where the patients were not identified correctly at phlebotomy. So therefore, patient misidentification seems to be a fundamental theme that is seen in and occurring at different steps of the transfusion practice. And what we also see is that near misses are not always being used as learning opportunities because you can always prevent a real event from occurring if you have investigated the near misses and address this to help build robust systems. And it's also important to involve the patients. So they need to be educated. They need to be involved in the decisions. We need to raise the awareness as well and involve them in the checks wherever possible. So this brings on to our next main recommendation from this year, that accurate patient identification is fundamental to patient safety. We need to build robust systems to ensure that this uh, patient misidentification is prevented. And we encourage the use of electronic systems throughout the transfusion services, as was also our recommendation from a couple of years ago. 
when we look at other error reports, so moving on to the anti-D immunoglobulin error reports, late administration or omission account for majority of these reports, nearly 65.6% .6 of the reports were due to the anti-D immunoglobulin errors. Similar themes as before continue here. So you have gaps in knowledge, understanding, um, communication errors, transcription errors are contributory. One of the key things we noted is the promoting early discharge from the delivery suites resulted in quite a lot of omission or the late administration. Therefore, the discharge procedures need to be really reviewed to prevent such delays. And we are beginning to see reports of incorrect cell-free fetal DNA results, and we saw five of them um, uh, in the last year. And we have also seen errors where the refrigerator monitoring and traceability errors have cropped in. So therefore, we need to build robust protocols uh, to address these. Um, there were 54 cases of immune entity in pregnancy. These are the cases where the D negative women become sensitized and they were found to develop immune entity, which is detected during pregnancy, either at booking or later in the index pregnancy. It is also evident that um, entity immunization can occur even when current best practice is being followed. And when we have looked at the cases, it is largely obesity, delivery beyond 40 weeks remain the risk factors for sensitization in, in those cases which are otherwise ideally managed. Another area we see is where following fetal maternal hemorrhage, um, the uh, confirmation has not been made where all the fetal cells are cleared and this is actually a gap that needs to be addressed as well. There is a need to continue auditing the entity pathway and to provide ongoing education to the clinical staff and pregnant women to optimize the practices. It is, I would encourage again, all cases of alloimmune entity which have been found for the first time in pregnancy should be reported to SHOT. <clears throat> Moving on to the next category of avoidable delayed or under over transfusion and incidents related to PCC. We had received around 279 cases, and in the scroll, there is the distribution of the cases among the different subcategories, but these are the highlights. So delayed transfusion continue to be the most common subcategory here, and there were four deaths in this category, three of them were due to delays. Again here, gaps in the knowledge and understanding of the urgency, delayed recognition, delayed activation of the MHP, the major hemorrhage protocol is evident. And there are errors in calculation of the volume in children, particularly for the volume of the transfusion. Poor communication con is continuing to contribute to several errors, especially with delayed under transfusion and avoidable errors. And all staff in transfusion must be adequately trained with respect to how the components, the administration of the components and the dosage of the components. And we often see that there are still questions that um, the uh, clinical staff are not aware of the un uh, administration of the PCC, which is resulting in delays. And there have also been cases where not accessing the specialist help in a timely manner has resulted in inappropriate transfusion decisions and therefore impacting patient care. And therefore, similar themes are actually coming through that we need to actually address these gaps in the training knowledge rationale so that people are making sound decisions and allowing, um, not allowing any deviations. When we look at IT errors, so these are where transfusion adverse events have been related to the laboratory information management systems, as well as other IT technology that, and related equipment used in the delivery of hospital transfusion services. Here are the key emerging themes. So there were around 283 reports and 155 near misses relating to IT errors. Now, um, we promote the use of electronic systems throughout the transfusion vein to vein, and these blood tracking systems help identify errors in the transfusion practice, and they should be implemented. But we also notice that staff are becoming more reliant on these systems to perform the primary patient identification, but they need to be using the IT systems as a confirmatory step. Now, with IT systems being increasingly used, we also need to make sure that for the IT system should be fit for purpose, they need to be configured correctly, they should be used appropriately by staff, and they should also be interfaced. We also note with the flags, they should not be complex, they should not be multifaceted, and it should not be easily overridden, at least the key flag should not be overridden by the laboratory staff without an adequate rationale. And there should be robust places, uh, processes in place for communication of the specific requirements to the laboratory so that there is timely application of the flags to the limb system. And ultimately, all these transfusion practices must be aligned within the hospital along with 
the digital strategies that are there in the wider NHS. And we also encourage our reporters to actually use the data that is available in our short reports from the IT errors and using this to inform practice and build better systems. Here are the laboratory key messages from the report. It covers that the laboratory staff should have adequate knowledge and of the clinical requirements of the transfusion so that the clinical and the laboratory teams are able to work coherently, collaboratively to um, deliver safe patient care. There is also focus on the loan workers. It is actually imperative that the loan worker should be adequately supported for, with their training, competency assessment, and the management should have a responsibility to ensure that all staff members are competent before exposing them to loan working. And there should be escalation procedures. They are clear, well-defined, with specialist support being accessible at all times. And this is also reflected in the UK Transfusion Laboratory Collaborative, which is also currently being updated. And the laboratory information management systems should be robust, as we have just highlighted, and they should be used to their full functionality. And the team have come up with a mnemonic of the uptake. These are the areas that need to be covered in a robust competency assessment. And this is just covering the areas that we said that staff need to be able to understand the procedure, why the procedure is being done. They should be able to perform it accurately, note the limits of the procedure, apply the knowledge, consider the risk, and explain the exceptions. So this is actually, these are parts of a robust competency assessment. This is just a visual stop tour of all the error reports that we have had. And now moving on to reactions in the patients that has been reported to um, SHOT. Um, starting off with the pulmonary complications post-transfusion. Now, this is actually showing the trend of the pulmonary complications um, in the last um, 11 years from 2008 to 2019. Now, they are on the rise, especially TACO. They're increasingly recognized, and there has been an increase in the reported cases year on year. This could also be due to increased awareness, but equally, we do note that the TACO checklist and appropriate risk mitigation measures are not always applied. And when we look at the causes of the transfusion related deaths, as we saw in the very beginning, um, the pulmonary complications remain a leading cause for transfusion related morbidity and mortality. Nearly 50% of the transfusion related deaths were due to this. Now, all cases with pulmonary complications up to 24 hours post transfusion should be reported to SHOT. And we also encourage our reporters to provide as much information as possible so that we ensure an adequate inference as well as effective learning is possible. And reporters should also, it's also important to include how, what was the respiratory status of the patients in the 12 hours prior to the transfusion, because that is then going to inform how we actually look at it in the imputability of the reaction. And in 2019, there were updated consensus criteria for both the two big categories that we know is the Charlie as well as the TACO. Now, cases that are submitted to SHORT, which do not meet the criteria for the TACO or the TRALI, but where there is a temporal relationship between the patient's deterioration and blood transfusion, they are then moved to a category called TAD, which is the transfusion associated dyspnea. Now, there have been revised consensus criteria that have been published for the TRALI this year, which poses a few challenges that it is not validated from a hemovigilance perspective. And while it can um, provide a clinical definition of the syndrome, it is based on arbitrary cutoff points and they're not always helpful in identifying risk mitigating measures. And we have discussed this further in the respective chapter. And the new TACO hemovigilance definition relies on the additional criteria, and we have already been using this for the last couple of years to demonstrate features of circulatory overload. And uh, it, it still continues that a significant number of the reported TACO cases do not appear to have had a TACO checklist uh, performed. And we would encourage people to use this because that is then allowing you to assess the risk in that individual patient and making appropriate decisions with the transfusion. We also note that in non-bleeding patients, an excessive volume of red cell transfusion to meet the target hemoglobin remains a significant factor. And this can be minimized by um, weight adjusted red cell dosing and medical management of anemia where possible. Now, the TAD category continues to serve as an important repository for cases. And this time we have actually subcategorized based on the, um, uh, the completeness of the information as TAD-C and TAD-IC, that is complete or incomplete information. And again, these are more, we don't know the exact pathophysiology of these. And there is an international group looking into the pulmonary complications and we would be working as a co-participants in that group. So please watch this space for further development on the pulmonary complications.
So therefore, I would like to stress the importance of reporting all cases to help our understanding so that we are able to actually provide more recommendations in this area up to 24 hours following transfusion. And prior to every component transfused in every patient, all of you are now familiar with the TACO checklist, this TACO assessment, assessment needs to be done um, prior to every transfusion. There are also additional short bites, educational video about pulmonary complications, and the TACO checklist for patients receiving convalescent plasma. All of these can be found on our website. Moving on to febrile allergic and hypertensive reactions. We saw just under 300 uh, reports relating to this, and these are the key highlights. Febrile reactions are the most commonly reported subcategory from this, and around quarter of them, nearly 25% are categorized as severe, and, but there are still difficulties in accurately categorizing these events. And red cells are usually associated with febrile reactions. Plasma and platelets are more commonly causing the allergic reactions. And we continue seeing the use of inappropriate use of antihistamines with or without steroids. They are um, still seen. So this graph just shows you how you know, the uh, red cells are more commonly associated with febrile and the plasma components are more common with the allergic reactions. And when you compare the percentage of the reactions between the apheresis as well as the pool platelets, the allergic reactions linked to the pool platelets continues to be lower than that of the apheresis platelets as reported. And uh, this is associated with the reduction in the plasma content. But there was very little difference in the febrile reactions that were reported with the pool platelets as well as the apheresis platelets. And in general, we also encourage our reporters to actually not to use the steroids indiscriminately with every acute transfusion reactions. Uh, moving on to hemolytic transfusion reactions, there were around 49 uh, hemolytic transfusion reactions that were reported. Four were due to acute, but majority were due to delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions. There were nearly 30 of them, and four were hyperhemolysis. Hyper and we would like to stress the importance that when selecting OD positive red cells for transfusion to OD negative individuals, it is important to check the patient for contraindications. In addition to the age child bearing potential, also note whether there is a history of antity in the patient or if the patient is transfusion dependent, so likely to get multiple transfusions. When we look at the um, um, and causative antibodies, the anti-JKA antibodies remains the most frequently implicated one in DHTR, the delayed one, followed by anti-DAFA and anti pic And the serological investigations of a hemolytic transfusion reaction should always include a direct antiglobulin test. And if that is positive, an elevate should be performed. And it's also, again, important to stress the importance that um, patients should be asked whether they have antibodies as part of the pre-transfusion process and any information that is obtained relate to the transfusion laboratory and acted on. And again, another education point is about the patients who receive transfusions as a day case. They need to be uh, educated about the possibility of a delayed reaction and the red flag so that they are able to seek the medical care as, uh, at a lower threshold. Now, I mentioned four cases of hyperhemolysis that were seen reported in 2019, and we are aware these are largely underreported. Three of these four cases are seen in, uh, were seen in uh, sickle cell disease patients, and in one of them, the patient had a delayed um, hemolytic transfusion reaction followed by a hyperhemolysis. And like in the preceding year, there was one case that was seen in a non-hemoglobinopathy patient. This was in a patient with myelodysplastic syndrome and cold agglutinin disease. So it is very important that everybody who is involved in transfusion should be aware of the risk of hyperhemolysis, recognize the signs and symptoms, and deal with it promptly. Now, we do notice some patterns in the reactions in uh, the hemoglobinopathy patients. The, hem the hemolytic transfusion reactions and the problems related to the specific requirements not met are accounting for nearly 72.7% of the reports in sickle cell disease patients, whereas it is the febrile allergic and hypertensive reactions which are more commonly seen in patients with thalassemia. And bottom line for managing these patients, preventing alloimmunization must be a priority. All transfusions should have a clear indication and they need to be authorized by a hematology team. And again, I would like to stress the fact that hyperhemolysis is a major cause of transfusion related morbidity, which may or may not be associated with alloimmunization. And every attempt should be made to actually seek the, uh, uh, any historical antibodies that may be there. So from patient, from the clinical nodes, from transfusion records, from national databases such as the SPICE in England. 
Moving on to transfusion transmitted infections in UK. Here are some key points to note. Any suspicion of a transfusion transmitted infection should be reported to the appropriate UK blood service. So as soon as possible so that it is fully investigated. Now all the UK blood services store a sample from every blood donation for at least three years. So therefore, further testing can be done on these samples during this time if a TTI is suspected. All look-back investigations should be reported by the UK Blood Services to the Infectious Disease Expert on the short working expert group. And it is important that all healthcare um, professionals who consent to patients for blood transfusions have up-to-date knowledge of the blood donation screening and a small potential for TTI. When we look at the TTI, again, further details are available in the chapter. There was one patient with confirmed transfusion transmitted HEV infection who died after being transfused in 2019. And there was one patient with probable transfusion transmitted HB, hepatitis B infection who developed chronic HBV infection following transfusion in 2015. You can find further details on these cases uh, in the chapter in the report. But it still remains that the risk of a potentially infectious HPV, HCV, or HIV window period donation not being tested, I'm sorry, not being detected on testing in the UK are very low at less than one per million donations tested. Now, UK continues the good track record with respect to bacterial transmissions. We have seen over the years several mitigating measures in place. Um, and with that, um, we have not really had any significant bacterial transmission. In 2019, there was no uh, uh, reports of a bacterial transmission. Moving on to pediatric hemovigilance. So pediatric reports accounted for 7.2% of the total cases reported to SHOT in 2019. There was one death reported, possibly related to transfusion-associated necrotizing enterocolitis. And as mentioned before, errors related to transfusion volumes continue to be an issue. There were six cases that were relating to this. And there are also um, errors in interpretation of the test results, failure to access specialist help, communication errors, and thereby impacting the transfusion decisions with potential patient impact. And pediatric febrile allergic hypertensive reactions are most common after platelets. And this is the usual pattern that we see in pediatrics year on year. And you may have also um, seen the announcement that we now have a new educational video covering um, a pediatric hemovigilance. And that has just been released and it is available on our website. Therefore, what can be done to improve transfusion safety in pediatrics? One of the important measures to remember is the weight-based dosing, and people need to be trained so it, uh, to know how, what, how to accurately dose the tra transfusion in pediatrics and neonates. So it should be as ML per kg, and it should be prescribed in ML, not units, not bags. And prompt communication, seeking specialist help is important. This year, we have also reviewed transfusion errors in um, stem cell transplant, hemopoietic stem cell transplant recipients uh, between the years of 2012 to 2019. And we have also identified the key steps in ensuring safe transfusions in these patients, essentially ensuring that everybody who is involved in the patient journey, starting with the patients and family, the main treating team, the shared care with, uh, um, with the, all the local hospitals with whom the patient would be actually moving for local care, as well as the laboratory, all need to be in, informed about the transplant plan, the transfusion plan, the need for the require, special requirements and updating the limbs. Um, all of you are also familiar with the human factors investigation tool that has been introduced since 2016 in short. So this is where we ask our reporters to score zero to 10 under each of the category and identify which are the key factors that, are, that were identified when investigating incidents. Now, uh, this has been a key um, chapter um, in our report for the last several years. The key themes from that chapter, he, here is what we find. There is um, an element of attribution bias when incidents are being investigated. So it is important that all incident investigators should analyze the evidence as impartially as possible. Again, this is explored a bit more in the chapter and I would encourage everybody to read that. Um, incident investigations need to incorporate questions using the human factors principles. We stress the importance of human factors in the last year's report as well. And what we also note is um, there are lots of missed opportunities where they're focusing on only blaming the individual and therefore not identifying the systemic causes. And the systemic causes need to be identified to be able to build long-term solutions. 
staff need to be trained in the basics for, of the human factor principles and they should have access to a human factors ergonomics expert in building the systems as well. And um, the National Comparative Audit also hosts the resources for the Wayne to Wayne Audit, which is based on human factors principles. And you can focus on different aspects of the transmission process and aim to build resilient, stronger systems, which are more user-centered. So what this is telling us is, throughout the theme of this, we learned that we need to be able to train our staff better we need to actually include not just the aspects of the technical training, whether it is clinical or laboratory, but we also need to actually train our staff in principles relating to patient safety. We need to train them about human factors. We need to train them about the quality improvement principles as well as leadership. Therefore, the training agenda needs to be actually holistic. And that leads us to our next main recommendation from the report that all staff should receive holistic training. And this is important for patient safety in transfusion. And all of you will also agree with me that an event is not always a disaster, but not reporting one could be. And worse than that, not learning from one is equally bad. And with all the common themes that we have seen, we have identified where the gaps are and what we need to do. So we need to have adequate staffing in place, we need to have a good skill mix. We need to have a good experience mix. We need to have, as I said, clear, simple processes with clear SOPs that are written, easy to follow. We need to redesign the education and training where we are introducing the question why, not just teaching people what and how to do a process. And we also need to be investigating incidents much more thoroughly, taking a view from the systems point of view. And we also need to learn from near misses. We need to embed and promote a just and a learning culture with a growth mindset. And we need to engage our staff and help provide the psychological safety. And above all, we need to be able to share our learning, review, as well as listen. We also know that the IT solutions need to be simple, need to be easy to use. It should not be increasing our cognitive load. It should be compatible. It should be working with every procedure. And it should require little or no training as possible. But taking a step back, it is important that while we make all these recommendations, it is important to note that there are different aspects of a healthcare system all working together to impact safe patient care. So whether it is leadership and governance, finance, availability of resources, whether it's the workforce or other essential resources, health information systems, or service delivery. So it is imperative that we recognize the interconnectedness of various factors in healthcare systems. What this means is that irrespective of whatever recommendations we put in, if there is lack of adequate staff, lack of resources, this any link is broken, that is then going to impact patient care. And therefore, we need to actually ensure that all of these factors are in place and that would improve patient safety, not just in transfusion, but everywhere in the healthcare. So this leads us to our um, uh, another main recommendation, which is healthcare management must recognize the uh, that safety and outcomes are multifaceted and healthcare leaders should be um, uh, ensuring that all of these are in place to improve patient safety. So to summarize, these are the four main recommendations that have covered during the course of this presentation from 2019. One is stressing the importance of accurate patient identification. Therefore, you ensure that all instances of patient misidentification and any part of the transfusion chain is addressed and you're building robust systems for that using electronic systems. We have also encouraged that the staff need to be trained in a holistic fashion, not just the um, technical bit of it, but also the non-technical bit of it, including awareness of human factors, cognitive bias, investigating incidents and patient safety principles. We've also actually, we're also going to release a short bite on cognitive bias in transfusion, and that would be ready um, on our website in the next week. We've also learned that the safety principles need to be embedded, not just looking at when things go wrong, but also when things go right. So we need to be able to start combining the principles of safety one and the safety two approaches to build uh, you know, robust systems in place. So we need to start learning even from excellence and normal practices. And we also need to recognize that ultimately everything is interlinked. So we need to put things in place. We need to have good leadership, good resources, appropriate funding available in place and good limb system in place to ensure that we are truly improving patient safety in transfusion. 
And I would like to take a moment to thank my team and members of the wider SHOT family, the SHOT steering group and the working expert group members, without whose dedication and hard work this would not have been possible. And I would also like to thank my esteemed colleagues at MHRA, the UK Forum, all our stakeholders, um, and thanks to all of you, our reporters, for continuing to submit and complete reports in these difficult times. For all this and more, we say thank you. I would also like to say a special thanks to Jenny, who has been incredible with the illustrations, and Reese and his team at Arc Document Solutions, who have weaved their incredible magic and worked tirelessly in getting our reports, summaries, videos to be such high quality, engaging resources. Lastly, I would like to, on behalf of the Royal College of Pathologists, invite you also to the symposium um, that is being held, which is now a virtual meeting on Thursday, the 26th of November, and details can be found on the Royal College website. Thank you. And back to you, Mark. Thank you very much indeed, Shruti. That, that was a, a very <coughs> helpful um, overview for those of you who've managed to download the um, download the full shot report and hopefully everyone will be able to download the full shot report fairly soon uh, you'll see that actually it's also um, a relatively uh, an extremely concise um, and well focused overview but of course the devil is in the detail now we're moving now into the q a session so hopefully all of the panelists have yeah switched their um their, their cameras back on um, yeah. we've got a number of questions which have appeared um on our q and a list some of which have been answered online uh, but if you have any questions if you if you'd like to type them into the q and a box um and we'll run through of those so um there, there are three people who wanted to know um, are there any data indicating error rates when there is an i when there is it downtime um, and how this impacts the transfusion process uh, who would like to i'll answer that mark thank you thank you megan so um Yes, there is evidence of errors during IT downtime. The most important thing about um, having an IT system is that it reduces errors through, uh, because manual processes are error prone. But if you do have an IT system and you've got to have well-documented downtime procedures, and what we've learned from shot reports this year is that that needs to cover remote sites as well as the site that you're working on because we've had some downtime that has affected a remote electronic issue on, on sites where the blood bank isn't. So um, the other thing that I would say about IT downtime is you need to heed the warning signs that your system perhaps is at risk of downtime because of capacity issues or because it's not been updated um, and uh, and we certainly have had some errors this year because of that because there were warnings that there were going to be problems but they weren't heeded and then systems broke down so um, yes we have learned a lot from SHOT uh, error, error reports uh, about downtime. Yeah. Now, there's um, another question which is linked to that one that I think uh, Jenny Davis was keen to address, which is Does the increased use of IT in hospitals risk dependency? Um, and, and if so, is this a good or a bad thing? Does it risk de skilling of healthcare professionals? Uh, Jenny, do, do you want to take that one? Yes, yes, thank you. I was, wanted to just say that the IT is there to support good practice and it's, it's there to be your second checker to prevent errors. So it, it shouldn't be there to replace the knowledge and skills of the laboratory and the clinical staff. But to, to answer the question about the dependency, I think, yes, there is the danger of dependency on IT systems. And I think that we need to be careful to stress to the staff that it is the second checker you do need the knowledge and skills. And as we just talked about downtime, if you don't have the knowledge and skills there in the first place, then you won't be able to cope with those downtimes. Thank you, Jenny. Um, one of the things that we were discussing um, earlier is the impact of COVID-19 um, on, on this meeting and the, and the process. So uh, Tom 
wanted to, there's a question about the association. Has there been any association with COVID-19 uh, and increased reports of trally? And I know actually Tom's been quite involved with some uh, advisory stuff around convalescent plasma. So perhaps Tom, you would like to pick that one up. Thank you, Mark. Um, the short answer is no, there has not been any association uh, documented either in this country or abroad. Um, it's sl slightly surprising to me that we have not seen more reports of um, pulmonary complications in people with COVID given the, the um, sudden deterioration that such patients can have and um, the, the patients with COVID who are re receiving transfusion are almost by de definition uh, fairly sick. Um, I, th I think the question does highlight the difficulty with the new consensus definition of trolley uh, in which um, you cannot make a trolley diagnosis. Um, um, an unstable respiratory state is an exclusion to make a diagnosis of trolley. Um, uh, which is of course going to be in the case for most of the patients with COVID, um, but there's no reason why COVID should protect you from having trolley. Um, there is um, um, a, a couple of interesting things with convalescent plasma. Um, we have seen one um, adverse event uh, reported in the recovery trial uh, with a pulmonary deterioration um, and it, it may be that this is in some way um, an association between the convalescent plasma um, and uh, lung injury although this case does not seem to be the same as what we classically understand by trolley. Um, so a word of caution that convalescent plasma may have uh, risks as well as uh, potential benefits and the, uh, highlighting the importance that these people are um, treated in trials. Thank you. Thanks very much Tom. Now one of the things which um, has been discussed uh, again quite a lot is, is the, are the human factors um, consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic um, and one interesting question which has, has been posed is a question for Chris Robbie and the MHRA which is how do we ensure hospital governance under the current pressures and so on continue to take the investigation of transfusion incidents seriously? Chris would you like to speak to that one? Thank you Mark. Um, I, I don't think I can actually answer the how other than to say that you need to use persuasion and evidence to, to do so. Um, but I can tell you about some of the tools that you might want to use. Um, the blood safety and quality regulations themselves. The responsibility for blood safety and quality is on the chief executive of the NHS Trust. Although it says person responsible for the management of a hospital blood bank, that is the NHS Trust itself and not the sole responsibility of the transfusion manager. So they have responsibility under the law for the quality and safety of blood and the investigation of incidents. Um, you would also perhaps want to link that into uh, the requirements of the blood safety and quality regulations to base everything on good practice. And there's the good practice guide that's published by the Council of Europe, uh, which has lots of chapters um, about improving quality and safety including um, subjects surrounding incidents and uh, deficiencies and putting those right, making sure that systems are improved rather than resorting to laying blame on human error. Um, it also, as part of that, want to use the evidence. You need to have capacity plans and then do gap analysis uh, within your quality system to see where the gaps are and whether you can meet those by improving your processes and then using that evidence from your quality system to feed that back up through management to, to say that these are the risks. Um, you can also refer to the MHRA 
chapter within the shark report so a bit of a plug there um, there's chapters from mike um, that will help about some of the um, findings that he's had when he's gone to visit people and also there's a chapter from inspectorate so you can use that evidence there to say if we don't put these things right then these are common things that are found in inspections uh, and one final point i'd like to make which i hope highlights the importance of regulation is um, we've actually despite the fact that there's been an increase a record increase in the number of reports coming in on sabre um, the analysis of incidents that occur within laboratories that are regulated has actually seen a slight drop so hopefully that gives some evidence that that regulating and improving quality systems improves um, error rates and that, that that can be used as evidence again to, to persuade people that thorough investigation um, is is a benefit that um, also i've got a uh, a message from mike he's online as well to, um, direct to me from the uh, the background is also mentioned education day so if anybody wants any information directly from mhra then get in contact with us and we can provide you with an education data to, to um, help um, identify improvements thanks chris that's very helpful um, there's been quite a lot of discussion in this year's shop report uh, about safety one versus safety two uh, looking at resilience um, particularly again around COVID, looking at why things work as well as why things don't work. And there's a question here from Emma uh, Copperweight and others. Um, will SHOT or would SHOT like good practice or excellence reports submitting from now on? And if so, um, in what category would they be? So that's one for all of the panel. But um, <clears throat> perhaps we start with Shruti uh, for that one and, and then maybe a comment from uh, Paula. Shruti, would you like to? Yeah. Um, what we wanted to highlight is actually that every system should then start focusing on instances of the excellent care as well. So I think if you go to, you know, there are plenty of uh, examples around where NHS trusts are actually building systems um, like your Datex. It is actually to Gratex, you know, to accept the reports and as part of the appreciative inquiry and then allowing staff to actually look into these normal practices. What we would start doing, we, uh, you know, is to look at, you know, we would want to look at systems where sharing the best practice. I think we need to look at how we can actually start doing that and exploring. Um, so rather than taking every single report, what we would encourage is these are inbuilt into systems locally into the hospitals, but we would then use examples of how they have actually incorporated this to shine the light on how they have actually built in so that can be shared with other trusts. Thank you. Um, Paula, any comments? Then we'll see if anybody else has any comments as well. I'd be, I'd be, it's an interesting one, I think. Uh, and I'd also be interested in whether the panellists think that we should formalise this process. Paula? I think it's a very helpful idea indeed. And certainly in past years, we've, we've been able to use one hospital's report to share with another who's had a similar incident and they've been able to help each other. So I'm all in favour of having such a system also because I'm conscious over the years that people don't want to hear bad news all the time. They want to hear good news and, and we could use this to encourage one another. But I'm not sure at the moment how we would collect those data. But absolutely, I think it's a good idea to try and do it. Thanks. Thank you, Paula. And anybody else have any comments on that? Otherwise, there's a, <clears throat> a question that I'd like to um, briefly cover on the timing of, or ask the panel to cover on the timing of uh, free fetal DNA errors. And then I think we'll be just about at the end of our time. So, um, my only small comment was another thing we've looked at um, within the immediate shot team is to reinvigorate the shared learning area. Um, so perhaps using that with examples, just as you mentioned, Paula, so sharing examples of good practice, good investigations. Thank you, Emma. So th there was um, a question here um, 
regarding free fetal DNA, which is where in the process do the um, free fetal DNA errors occur? And, and two or three people were keen to ask that question. I think Courtney, do you want to answer that? Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button there. Um, from from the reports that we've had, and, and there were only five reports uh, this year that highlighted cell-free DNA errors. Um, they were they were picked up at delivery, and the belief is that they occurred um, at testing and initial testing. Now, of the five, three were further tested to to determine whether it was wrong blood in tube. Um, and the belief is that it wasn't wrong blood in tube. So, so we believe that it's, it's at the laboratory that these errors occur. Okay, thank you. Um, if I could just also say that the, um, with the introduction of that uh, new test and the fact it is possible for there to be both wrong blood in tube and um, it would look like some yeah. laboratory errors, that the um, the picking up of new uh, immune anti D in a subsequent pregnancy is a, is is uh, very important, and we are now asking questions about whether the um, woman had a cell free DNA test in the previous pregnancy and the results, because that will give us quite useful information on error rates. Thanks, Jane. I think we're more or less now at the end of our time. We've just run one minute over. So to wind up, I'd like to say a huge thank you, first of all, to um, Shruti, and I was going to say the team in the office, but actually the team who are not in the office, um, but who have been working from home uh, to bring all of this together. Um, it's been an interesting experience trying to have a mini conference as a webinar. And obviously we are working towards having some sort of a proper shop symposium, um, either later this year or at the normal time next year. Whether or not that will be a physically present symposium or a big webinar um, is yet to be decided. Mark, um, we are also having a poll and uh, some final remarks. So I think Emma, um, there was a quick poll for three, four questions that we wanted to take real time feedback. I yeah, so you can oh, see a live poll hopefully up on your screens there. There are just four very quick questions, which I think are all self-explanatory. Um, first is just to find out um, who our list, wherever our listeners are from geographically. And then the next three questions um, are just to be answered on a rating scale with one being low and five being high please so if everybody could please vote now um, and just while your votes are coming in just to reiterate that we will be sending out a more thorough evaluation survey online um, and obviously this is shot's very first webinar and um, with current times and as part of our virtual strategy anyway, we are planning more of this type of event. So your evaluations and feedback will be incredibly valuable to us to inform those. Um, and just to reiterate, to reiterate as well that, that there are a wealth of resources available on the website, such as the Shop Bites, and Jenny's wonderful illustrations are available to download on the website as well and those are available for all to use in teaching materials so are we able to get the poll results is that something you can bring up michelle I can't see them on my screen, but perhaps while we're waiting for those, Simon, yeah. you can just come in. Yeah, um, just remains for me to say, really, thanks for an excellent presentation, Shruti. It's really informative. Um, thanks to the panel again, and also uh, special thanks to Jen Leonard with her wonderful uh, artistry. And of course, uh, without this help of Michelle Darcy from NHSB team, we wouldn't have been able to uh, run this conference or this webinar as, as smoothly as we thought we have done. 
Um, the recording of the webinar is going to be uploaded onto the um, SHOT website, so you'll be able to see this, and colleagues that haven't been able to attend will <coughs> be able to review that as well. Um, so just a to say thanks for everyone and, and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.